This morning, uh, we're continuing in the life of Jesus, and so today we're looking at Jesus, the willing sacrifice. And so if you will turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 22. Now, we're going to go back to uh, Exodus 12, and so put, uh, put a card in there or a piece of paper or whatever back to Exodus 12 because we're going to go there a little bit. I want to begin with this story. A very poor man lived in a remote village. Every day before his time of meditation in order to show his devotion, he was very devoted to God. And since food was so scarce, he put a dish uh, of butter up on the windowsill as an offering to God. One day his cat came in and ate the butter. To fix the problem, he began tying the cat to the bedpost each day before uh, um, or during his quiet time, his meditation time. He was so revered in his his, uh, uh, commitment that others joined him and became his disciples and they worshipped as he did. And generations later, long after... This man was dead. His followers placed an offering of butter on the windowsill during their time of prayer and meditation. But not only that, each one bought a cat and tied it to the bedpost. There are many traditions that we have. We have many traditions in This church, many families have traditions, and sometimes we don't know where they came from or how they came about, but we have many traditions. Some are great, some are not so great. One of the traditions that I love about this church is that every Sunday after church, we eat. That's a great tradition. Um, And so... As families have traditions and churches have traditions, depending on the church, depending on the denomination, depending on the makeup of the people, the culture of the the people. But when it comes down to it, in our church, though there are many traditions, there are only two ordinances that we observe as a church. One is believer's baptism, and the other one is communion, otherwise known as the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper. And so today I want to talk to you about communion and why we observe communion. Now, Jesus made many incredible statements throughout his ministry. Um, and... Uh, this one that he that he uh, quote, that he said in John chapter ten verse eighteen is one of the I think biggest. Of course, everything Jesus said is big, okay? But this is like one of those things that really make you think about why he did what he did. In John chapter ten verse eighteen, he said, "No one takes." It from me, and referring to his life, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Now, for centuries, there have been arguments, there have been debates, there have been a blame, there have been finger pointing about who killed Jesus. But the reality is, he willingly went to the cross. He went on his own accord. He was a willing sacrifice. He was a willing sacrifice in complete submission to and in agreement with the Father. John MacArthur states, God chose his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be the final Passover lamb. 
So the timing of this Passover that we read about in Luke chapter uh, 22 is significant. It was God's splendid design before the foundation of the world that this event would take place on this particular day because it was the 14th day of Nisan. Now, when I study this and I read this, there was a typo uh, in one of the documents. And so when they spelled Nissen, they put two S's in there. So I got a little excited because I thought it said Nissan, okay? And I thought, wow, there's a Japanese reference in the Old Testament. But it was a typo. Nissen is the month, and the 14th day of Nisan, just before dusk. You know the story. A few days earlier, Jesus entered into Jerusalem. We call it Palm Sunday, and people were laying down their coats. They put him on a donkey, and he came riding in, and they were waving palm branches, and they were saying, Hosanna. Hosanna, blessed is the coming king of our father, David. We call it Palm Sunday. And here we are, our story is on Thursday, just a few days later. And a a lot of things took place uh, that we know about in those few days. First, we know that Jesus went into the temple and he cleared the temple of the money changers. We know that the authority of Jesus was challenged by the Pharisees and the scribes. We know that there had been a plot to kill Jesus, and this scheme was underway. And now it is Thursday, the 14th day of the month of Nisan, And the 1,500-year-old tradition of the feast of the Passover. In verse 14, it says, And when the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. So just a little bit about the Passover. You have to go back to Exodus chapter 12, and I want us to go back there, but if you have seen the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston as Moses, remember that? Let my people go, you know? And then you had Yule Brenner playing who? That's right, Ramses the Pharaoh, and his famous quote was, so let it be written, so let it be done, right? It's a classic, and it's, and it's awesome, it's, and that's back when Hollywood used to do a pretty good job of depicting Bible stories. So you know the story, and it is that uh, the Israelites were in captivity in Egypt for over 400 years, and they were enslaved. And God delivered them through Moses. There were 10 plagues that God brought on Egypt, and it was the 10th And final plague that finally broke Pharaoh's will to let them go. And the tenth plague was, and we find that in verse 12 of Exodus chapter 12. He says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So then God gives specific instructions to the Israelites and whomever, whoever wanted to exercise this escape. And that he would pass through as he would pass through, that he would pass over those who had followed his instructions. 
you find in verse 1 of Exodus 12, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregations of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. And in verse 5, he says, Your lamb shall be without blemish. Without blemish, meaning the lamb should be without spot. Sort of a, a perfect lamb, perfect for sacrifice. A male of a year old or, or younger, and this simply means that, that a lamb that is innocent, it's symbolic of innocence. And he said, you may take it from the sheep or the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. It's interesting, this word keep here is so from the 10th day to the 14th day, you're supposed to keep this lamb. Interestingly, the same word is used in Genesis 2.24 when God said the two regarding Man and woman, when God first created man and woman, and when he said, the two shall become one flesh. It's the same word, keeping together. So this wasn't just any lamb. This wasn't just uh, just go and pick one out. There was, it was methodical and it was intentional that you pick a spotless lamb, a young lamb, and you were to keep it with you as a family member. That lamb was to be in your house, not with the other animals, but with you. Keep it with you until the 14th day. Then, verse 7 says, They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two door uh, posts, and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of its raw, any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain. This is symbolic of a total sacrifice, not a partial sacrifice, but a total sacrifice. You know that old saying about the uh, chicken and the pig at breakfast time? For the chicken, it's a contribution. She just lays an egg. For the pig, it's a sacrifice because he becomes the bacon. Well, here is a picture of a total sacrifice. Let none of it remain. When I first moved here, Don and I moved here in 2002, and we, um, we lived uh, for a short time, about three months, until we could find a place that was suitable, suitable for us, an apartment. And by the way, it was sticker shock. We came from a 3,000-square-foot, four-bedroom house in Florida where I was paying a mortgage of $900 a month to an apartment of two bedrooms with a subterranean garage. Uh, 
at $2,800 a month in Century City. I thought, dear God, what have I done? <laughs> but until we could find a place of our own, we lived uh, in, this, uh, in the guest room of a Beverly Hills mansion. And I got to tell you, I got a little used to that. I mean, you know, when you get past a million, two million dollar uh, frames and pictures on the, uh, in the guest bedroom wall, uh, it, 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 was, uh, it, it was an experience. Every dinner, uh, dinner time was a seven course meal. And it was like eating out at the finest restaurant every single night. I used to have a 28-inch waist, and that three months just killed me. <laughs> well, one of the things that really annoyed me was, that, and especially at dinner time, because there was an intercom box, like, right outside the dining room. And every time we would sit down to eat dinner, uh, someone would call Juan, who was the butler, someone would call Juan on the intercom. And they would just say, Juan, Juan, Juan. I mean, almost like rhythmically. Like, and you kind of get annoyed after a while, right? And it's like, come on, Juan, answer the intercom. Then to my embarrassment, I realized that the intercom was not saying Juan, but it was saying one every time the door number one would open. And then if someone would open the front door, which was door number one, and it would remain open, the security system would notify the intercom system that door number one is open. And so it would just say one, 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 until somebody went and shut it. I know, it's pretty embarrassing. <laughs> well, in this story, it's unlike a Beverly Hills home. Where you have door number one, door number two. You have an upstairs, uh, upstairs door. You have a garage door. You have the French doors that go out to the pool. Uh, and you have all kinds of doors. Unlike that in, in, a, in a mansion in Beverly Hills, in the homes here in Egypt, in the slaves' quarters, there was one door. That was it, just one door. There was one way that you went in and one way that you came out. And that's significant. And next week I'm going to be talking about Jesus, the door. He said that he is the door. And so we're going to be looking at that next week. But there were no alternatives. There were no alternative ways of entry or exit to these dwellings. And it's on that door. The only possible way to escape, and the only possible way to enter, God instructs the Israelites to take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house. Now, I love nuggets, and I don't mean McNuggets at McDonald's. I love when you read the Bible and you're studying the Bible and there are just some nuggets that just kind of, as you, as you pan and as you, as you dig deeper, you find some nuggets. Don't you, don't you like it when you, when you dig into the Bible, into the Word of God and study and you find some nuggets? Well, I think there are three nuggets that we can find uh, in this passage when Moses was instructed by God to tell the people to put the blood on the doorposts and on the lintel. Number one, there had to be a blood sacrifice. Someone had to shed or something had 
to shed its blood. Innocent blood had to be spilled. Number two, the blood was placed on the outside of the door, not on the inside, but the outside of the door. For the world to see, for the neighbors to see, for everyone to see that this is a household of faith. It is a public commitment, a public of their faith. And number three, God's deliverance from the tenth and final plague was not exclusive to the Israelites. It was this escape, this plan was available to anyone and everyone who would seek the remedy. Salvation is for all who seek it. And then he says in verse 13, The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, that when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Because of the sacrifice of innocent of an innocent lamb, he says, I will spare those whose doors are covered with its blood. And now we come back to Luke chapter twenty two. And when the hour had come, this is the same day. For the last 1,500 plus years that the Israelites have been celebrating from the very first Passover, which was on the 14th day of Nisan. And now we are the 14th day again. They've practiced this. They've celebrated this feast all of their lives. Isn't it fitting? That on that day, you see, in Judaism, the day starts at sundown. So the 14th day, sundown, is when they started the Passover feast. It was the next day before sundown because once the sun went down the next day, it would be the 15th day. So in the 14th day, Jesus has this Passover communion, the last Passover and the first communion with his disciples. Then he would go out into the garden and pray, and then he would be arrested, and then he would be taken and beaten in mock trials, and he would hang on the cross, and he would die, and he would be hastily buried into a borrowed tomb before sundown. And don't you know that some of the people, some of the people got this. That just as an innocent lamb was to be slain in the very first Passover, here is an innocent John called him the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Make no mistake about it. This wasn't a a plan gone wrong. This wasn't where God had a plan and somehow it went wrong. This was designed from the very beginning and it was orchestrated by God from the very beginning that he would become the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Interestingly here, 
in this passage. In the New Testament, it says, And when the hour came, he reclined at the table. We, when we sit at a table to eat, what do we do? In the South, we have a saying, we belly up to the table. Right? I mean, we're leaning forward and digging in. But in their day, they, they would sit at a table that was low. They would sit on cushions and they would recline where they would put, I know it might be bad manners today, but they would put their elbow on the table, their left elbow, and they would eat with their right hand. And their legs would be back behind them. They're kind of laying down as they eat. But interestingly, in the Old Testament, in Exodus, when God instructed Moses to tell the people, what he told them was to pack your bags and gird your loins and be ready to leave. It was a completely different mindset. But over the course of 1,500 years, they got a little relaxed. And the custom became where you recline. I think that's a picture of many people in the church today. We've just gotten comfortable with where we are. We've gotten comfortable with our lives. We've gotten comfortable with our system. So we come in, and, and if the air temperature is not just right, Oh, that's not good. Maybe God is speaking to us through this passage. Should church be a place of comfort? Or should it be a place of challenge? Now we see a little glimpse into Jesus' mindset here. He says... Uh, in verses 14 and 16, he says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He's been looking forward to this for a long time. And there's a double negative there. And it's, it really, if you were to translate it into the English, it would, mean, it would say, with desire I desire. The Jews had a way of, of repeating words to emphasize the importance. And so he's saying, I really, I earnestly, I have been thinking about this for a long time. I desire to do this. In a way, he's saying, I have to do this. This is not a take it or leave it kind of thing. It has to. To happen. You see, Jesus knows he knew what was coming next. He knew that he would be betrayed. He knew that he would be arrested. He knew that he would have a mock trial. He knew that he would be beaten. He knew that he would be put to death on a cross. He knew that he would be buried. in a borrowed tomb before the sun went down. He knew that for 1,500 years there was a substitute sacrificial lamb, but he was the real deal. The Passover for all those years were a foreshadow. It was looking toward the cross, this Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But the hour has now come. And on that night, verse 17 says, and he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it, distribute it among yourselves. The 
the exception of Judas, they were true recipients of God's saving goodness. And you and I, in just a moment, we're going to take the cup and we're going to take the bread and we're going to observe communion. We're going to observe the Lord's Supper and remembrance of what he did. I want you to really think about the fact that he did all of what the Bible says that he did. He did it willingly. He did it because he loves you and me. Do you ever get the feeling sometimes that maybe God is not close to you or he's, he's, uh, he doesn't care as much about you? You think about this. You think about the excruciating pain that he went through for you and for me. He says in verse 18, For I will, I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He says, you will. You will do this in remembrance of me, but I will not eat with you and drink with you until the, the kingdom of God is fully and completely finished. So, we see in verse 20, and we know from other passages, that this cup represents the blood of Jesus. So, when you have in the Old Testament, you have the lamb that had to shed its blood, and it was the blood that was on the door that spared the death and destruction, the wrath of God. And you have in the New Testament, you have the Lamb of God, Jesus, who takes away the sins of the world. It was His blood that paid the penalty of our sin. And so, in doing some comparison here, it's very interesting between the Passover and the Lord's Supper. Verse 19 and 20. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they ate, they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant. In my blood. So you see you, that from Exodus, from God delivering his people from slavery, and this tenth plague of the killing of the firstborn of each household, whereby sprinkling the blood over the door. Those who did so, those who were faithful, those who committed themselves to the instruction of God were spared the heartache and the destruction. And it's very interesting when we compare that on the Passover side, it was held on the 14th day of Nisan. On the Lord's Supper side, the first Lord's Supper, it was held on the 14th day of Nisan. In both the Passover and the Lord's Supper, there was a requirement of a blood atonement. On both occasions, there was a requirement of bodily sacrifice. In both, it was instituted as a Memorial. Both in the Exodus account of the Passover 
God said that it would be a memorial day. And on, of course, the Lord's Supper, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And both, God, uh, both sides, God provides a way of escape from death on the Passover side and the Lord's Supper side. God provides a way of escape from spiritual death. And the Passover looks to the cross and the Lord's Supper looks back to the cross. So let me ask you this question. Do you know Jesus? Do you know him? I'm not asking you if you know about him. I don't know. I'm, I'm not asking you if you know the history of who Jesus is. I'm asking you if you have a personal and intimate relationship with him. Have you surrendered your life to him? Is he the most important thing in your life? Is your life marked by the blood sacrifice of Jesus? If not, receive him today. Accept him today. Surrender to him today. I promise you, I promise you that your life will be different, will be changed. I promise you that your life will have meaning. I promise you that you will discover true purpose for your life. I promise you that it will not be easy. I promise you that it might be one of the hardest things that, that you will do. I'm not going to paint a picture for you that following Jesus is, a, is like a bed of roses. And nothing but sunshine. In fact, when you follow Jesus, you have the same problems. You have the same difficulties. You might have the same health issues or financial issues and other issues in your life that your neighbor does. If there's an earthquake again in Northridge, your house is not going to be spared necessarily while everyone else around you, their house is destroyed. That's not how it works. But how it works is that Jesus didn't come to build a bridge over troubled waters. But instead, he gives you a tunnel so that you can go through it. He gives you peace in the midst of a storm, not the absence of a storm, but in the midst of a storm, he gives you peace. That's what Jesus does for you and me. Do you know him? Now, I had not planned this, uh, but I feel compelled to do this and so I'm just going to ask if there's anyone here who would like to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior is there anyone here who would like to surrender their lives to the Lord I'm going to ask you to do something that's really gutsy I'm going to ask you to do something that's probably going to shock your world I'm going to ask you to do something that's probably going to question your courage. It's going to challenge your courage. I'm going to ask you, if you want to accept Jesus, that you 
stand up right now if you want to accept Jesus. Is there anyone in here that wants to accept Jesus right now? I ask you to stand. Anybody? It's gutsy, isn't it? All right. That means that most everybody in here, we're already believers. We're already followers of Jesus. And others of you who are not, I pray that you ask God to reveal to you who he is. And I pray that the day of salvation will be soon in your life. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this wonderful time that we have where we can open your word and we can study it. We can, we can be challenged by it. We can be encouraged by it. We can be blessed by it. And Lord, I thank you for this communion time that you allow us that you tell us to do it often and that as often as we do it to remember you. And God, we want to remember best we can. The sacrifice that you made on that cross. That you didn't go kicking and screaming. You didn't think it was unfair, but you willingly went to the cross and you hung there for me. You shed your blood for my sins. I thank you, Lord, that we have this ordinance of communion of the Lord's Supper that we can remember your sacrifice. Help us, Lord, not to take it lightly. Help us not to just do it as, as something to do that you would stir our hearts to know you better and to be even closer to you in our walk. We thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.